grab our 3080 and then slide it in. Ray tracing ultra preset at over 60 frames a second in the city. I'm being attacked by crabs. I'm being attacked by crabs. Hello and welcome to this super special build guide where my introduction sequences aren't getting any better. But hopefully the builds are because today we've got some super powerful hardware in front of us. We've got an RTX 3080, we've got a Ryzen 5, 5600X, which is pretty much the gaming CPU that I think most people want to go for now. We've got the latest case from Razer, it's their first one, the Tomahawk, and Gigabyte, who actually reached out and wanted to sponsor this video, have finally sent me over some of their vision range. And the reason that I'm so excited about these is not only because it offers, I guess, a few more things for creators rather than gamers, but as you can clearly tell, we have this lovely white aesthetic that is actually really hard to come by. So what I thought we would do, rather than just do an entirely white PC and then everything almost gets a little bit lost I guess is to have this black Razer Tomahawk case we have everything inside white and then we use a secret component to actually bring it all together but of course this being a PC centric build video we're not only going to walk you through all of the different components and show you what they can do but we're also going to talk about the build process we're actually going to be building this gaming computer showing you how easy or hard it might be but we're also going to give you those all important gameplay benchmark numbers first things first you're going to want to grab yourself plenty Plenty of space and actually build everything on top of the motherboard before you put it inside your chassis. This just makes it a little bit easier. And the motherboard that we're using here today is the Gigabyte B550 Vision D. This is a very well priced motherboard for all of the features that you have, but if you were to go for X570 it would of course cost you even more. And B550 still supports pretty much all the features really that I think most people would want from their motherboard. You still get PCI Gen 4 SSD support, Gen 4 support for the graphics card as well, which we will be using both here today but as I sort of mentioned in the intro you can see we have this entirely new design here and it just looks so different to all of the other gaming boards that you see it's just really refreshing actually I mean come on just look at this how is this not a cool looking motherboard plenty of fan headers for good cooling you've got dual m.2 slots but of course this one will be limited to PCI gen 3 you've got Wi-Fi on board we've even got RGB headers but the party really gets started when you turn to the back because I mean just look at this IO I don't think I've ever seen this many ports before on a B550 motherboard. But in the short term, something actually much more important is that this motherboard does support something called Q Flash Plus, which doesn't sound that interesting, but this is actually what enables all Ryzen 5000 CPUs to actually work out of the box. Press this little button and it will update the BIOS for you, allow you to use that new CPU, no hassle or no older system hardware required. Anyway, let's actually move on and start this PC build off the ground. So you do need to grab your motherboard, place it upon your box, nice and neatly. Then you can grab your CPU, which is the Ryzen 5 5600X. And to be clear, this isn't the best CPU in the world that you can buy, but I think it's the one that makes the most amount of sense really for a gaming PC, because you still have six cores, so that's plenty of performance across the board. You can have multiple applications open at the same time whilst gaming. But fundamentally, the thing that actually makes this such a great gaming CPU is that it has very strong single core performance. And assuming you have the graphics card that can keep up, this does actually translate into better FPS, and it's far more important than just having more cores. To install the CPU, it's very simple. All you need to do is raise this little lever. You grab your Ryzen processor, and then you just drop it down so that the gold arrow actually lines up with the gold arrow, which in this case faces the Ryzen text towards the I.O., so not down the bottom of the motherboard. Once you've done that, it's then time to grab some RAM, and you might be thinking this isn't white, but here's a little surprise for you. I lost the box for that one. So we have some white RAM from XPG. I've used this a couple of times. This is the D50, and it actually works a real treat. This is 3600 megahertz, I believe, which is fantastic for a gaming PC, as it gives you maximum performance without really costing you any more than 3200 megahertz. It is very, very simple. Just make sure it is pushed all the way in until it clicks. Next up, it's time for our SSD, and this is also from Gigabyte. This is the Aorus NVMe Generation 4 SSD. And if you're not really up to date with the difference between Gen 3 and Gen 4 drives, it just gives you more bandwidth, and it means that they can get even faster speeds on these things. This Aorus SSD does come with this pretty cool little gold heatsink that you can use, but because I'm trying to make like an all white build, I'm just gonna slot this in the board itself, which I don't recommend copying. But you know, you can if you want. 
Well, that's the motherboard pretty much done, but before you proceed, it is worth actually checking your cooling solution, because if you're going for like an air cooler, put this on now, but even if you're going for like an all-in-one sort of affair like we have here, it might have a block that's easier to attach now and then put it in the case. I'm not suggesting that you put the whole radiator on, just the mounting hardware. Here we have a little bag that says AM4, so get these four screws out of the box now. Then you can unscrew the default AM4 mounting hardware that's actually found on your boards. Radiators and things can be a right pain in the bum, to be honest, to fit sometimes, but... It all starts with good, easy to use mounting hardware. I sound like I work at home base or something. Someone said to me earlier that one of the best feelings in the world is actually going to a place like home base, other garden centers are available, finding the compost and then just going bang. I also used to like try and do parkour by like running on all of the compost bags and shouting mirror's edge. I was a cool kid. Anyway, moving on, we can now grab our case and for some strange reason, this is the heaviest case I think I've ever lifted in my life. I don't know what's in this. Normally they get heavy once you build your computer inside, but this is heavy literally right out of the box. Like why? Why is it so heavy? And it's very reminiscent actually of NZXT's cases, but the main thing that I've noticed that isn't actually that obvious to be honest from the pictures themselves is that these front air takes are actually way thicker than you get on the NZXT ones. To be honest with you, I would actually stay away from putting a radiator in a case like this unless you're using it as an exhaust like we're doing here as it's just a lot better for your sort of gaming orientated airflow. The fact that you can do it and that there is the extra airflow is appreciated because of course there is a very solid front panel that isn't the best for airflow in the world. The doors are very easy to remove though, they're just magnetic, you push them in and then they just lift off. They have got very modern with their whole, well, modular design language because around the back you can see you have all of these different cable covers that just remove like this, so cable management should be pretty easy. But you probably notice you get this little RGB hub as standard, and that's because this is a Razer RGB case. So you actually have underglow chroma lighting all the way down the bottom. Tell you what though, Razer, I mean, if you're really gonna charge all of this money and then you give us one standard non-RGB fan at the back, why? Pressing on with our build, let's grab our case and lay it down flat so we can actually plop in our motherboard, just drop it in and then screw it into place. Yes, look at this. Didn't I say I knew what I was doing? Just about, you can see everything inside here is really gonna stand out, even without any RGB lighting present, which don't worry, we will be adding. I think this is gonna turn out great. These panels as well, they just get in the way and you can't take them off. Razor. With the motherboard installed, it's time to actually talk about our cooler. So this is the brand new Kraken, what is it? The X63, I think, yes. The X63 RGB, and the difference between this and the older model is that you get slightly a bigger screen, but more importantly really is that it actually comes with the RGB hub as standard. So if you want to add more air RGB fans like we're going to do here today, then you can do so without an additional controller. And the reason that I've gone for these is because you probably noticed that slightly untraditionally, you get these little like RGB rings rather than the RGB sort of within the fan itself. And I think this is actually gonna bring the build together a little bit better because you essentially have white within the fan itself. So it's almost gonna like be the glue between the motherboard and the case. We're going to mount this at the top of course. So we're going to want to have the fans actually blowing through the radiator. And when we plop it in, we wanna make sure that those cables are actually facing the back. Something that's really awesome about these NZXT fans though is that they daisy chain together. So you don't need all of that horrible RGB cable clutter that you might normally get. But it is gonna block off that little CPU eight pin. So what we're going to want to do before we put our radiator in is to actually open up our power supply and get that cable in that space as it's just gonna make it a whole lot easier and save us a load of hassle later. And the power supply that we're using might be a little bit unusual, but this is a very good value power supply. This is the CX750F RGB. So it does go with our theme. But believe it or not, the reason I've gone for this isn't only like the value proposition, it's because the white cables that you get in this are going to go perfectly with our build. It is fully modular, which is very good for the price actually, so you don't have to use all of the cables and have an untidy build. So here's this little eight pin at the top. Boom, clicks in. And then we just feed this cable through to the other side. And then to show you exactly why that was so essential, if we do a little test fit now, you see that that completely covers up that eight pin and you just wouldn't be able to get that in without 
taking it all apart. I'll also take my own advice when it comes to installing this fan at the back. So this is another Hue 2. Untie all of these cables and then just drop it in as neatly as you can. I'm plugging in all of the fans as well just to give us as much room as possible. Installing the pump head is a lot easier than the rest of it though. You just line these little screw holes up and then you just gently press it down until they're all nice and secure. Grab these little thumb screws and screw it into place. Have these little tubes facing the bottom as this is gonna make sure there are as few air bubbles in your system as possible. And this is gonna increase the longevity of your pump and reduce any horrible noise and gurgling that you might get from that air building in a place you don't want it to be. The front of the case does seem to just pop straight off and we do indeed have that RGB plate that sits there. It's nice that this is all, well, contactless, I guess. So it's just got pins, so you don't need to worry about wires when you take it off or anything. But I'm actually gonna put some more Hue 2 fans at the front. But the problem is that, well, you can only see one side and due to the way airflow works, we actually need to see this side. So it's probably not the most efficient use of RGB in the world, but I mean, if you're buying a pack of Hue 2 fans and you need more fans, you may as well just complete the set. Fast forward a little bit and our fans are now installed and there's quite a cool little bracket actually. So this whole thing comes out, you put the fans in, then put it back in, save yourself a little bit of time. I've also plugged in some of the IO. So we've got HD audio, USB 3, which does stick out a little bit, unfortunately, power switch, reset switch, USB. But the thing that is noticeably missing, which was very confusing, but I managed to work out what had happened, is that there's no USB-C for the front panel, but this case does have USB-C. That's because they have, of course, moved that round to the rear I.O. So you're not missing out on any ports, but if you do go for this exact combination, you'll have one round the back rather than on the front. Let's go ahead and get that power supply in though. And this is when it's gonna be a little bit make or break, I think, for the whole design. You're not gonna to need too much really, just the ATX, your CPU, which we have, of course, already pre-rooted, PCIe, and then we will need one SATA port as well. Two actually, one for the pump and then one for the case itself. Well, that's... <laughs> what I've done is plug the wrong end into the motherboard and now I have to take it all apart, take it all apart just to swap it over. So by saving time, all I've done is make life even more difficult for myself. I, I, I'll be honest, I'm pretty unhappy about that. Five, 10 minutes later, and we're ready to resume where we left off. Noid Marcus is gone, acceptance Marcus is back. Just grab that CPU cable, hoping I haven't made the same mistake twice. Plug that in, hooray, and then drop this into the little basement at the bottom. I do have to deliver the bad news, which is that this power supply will only go downwards because there aren't enough screw holes on this case. It doesn't really matter. It just means that we're gonna have more RGB shining downwards rather than shining up, which is what I was going for really, but there you go. And then the moment you guys have probably been waiting for, the RTX 3080, and check that out. It's not only white, but you've got all of these silver accents as well. Gigabyte at the top, two eight pin power connections. So none of that funny alien stuff that you'll get with the founders. And then on the back, you've got a very nice looking back plate, plenty of design actually. So this is gonna stand out. Grab our 3080 and then slide it in. Are you ready? And check that out. Do you see how different this looks to most gaming computers? There's just so much going on, yet because you've got the sort of black background, it essentially just brings your attention to all of the bits really that you're after. I wasn't lying about those cables either, was I? Look, perfect white. Ugh, there you go. A pretty heavy gaming computer, but one that's come on a lot. And don't forget, if you do want to add more hard drives or anything, you can down the bottom. Let's give this a test though and see if it actually will fire up and work. I don't actually know whether this BIOS is up to date or not. It looks really good with all of those white fans and things going there, doesn't it? Actually, even having those NZXT fans at the front still does give you a fair old bit of light, actually. It does look like we're getting plenty of error codes, though. It's still cycling through, but I imagine it's a CPU error, to be honest with you. So, error code 51, so it looks like we're gonna have to grab our little BIOS that I made earlier, turn this off and flash the BIOS. Press Q flash plus, which is up here. I was trying to work out exactly why it wasn't really doing anything and I looked it up 
and you have to rename the BIOS file to gigabyte.bin, all in capital letters. I did take the RAM out in a little bit of panic, so I'm not sure if you need to do this, but as I said, I panicked. Aha, it's doing something. The light has gone out. We have error code 21, which I assume will be no RAM. Yes! Now that was simple, but I'm not gonna lie, it was definitely quite scary. But as long as you rename that BIOS file, seems to be all good. <sighs> Can you imagine if I'd got this far and it didn't work? I would be so sad. When have you ever seen a BIOS that looks this cool? It's all like futuristic, it's gold. Here we are then, it is a new day, a new dawn, and we have our system ready to go. We've got some games running, I've tuned all of the fans and everything, and I have to say that I'm really happy with how everything turned out really. I do think that it's not the easiest case to build in in the world, and it doesn't necessarily offer the best value for money, but if you like the look of it, I think it is quite well designed. I do like the fact that you have so much airflow at the front despite that solid panel. Let's begin our journey with some Jedi Fallen Order and ignore the lag. This is purely just down to the frame rate counter we've got open at the moment. But this is an absolutely beautiful game and I've only really started playing this because it's actually available on EA Access. This is running at absolute max settings again or the epic presets at 4K resolution. And you can see we're getting an absolutely huge frame rate really. Even if you don't have your DLSS and your ray Tracing, you can not only get a game that runs really well, but you can get one that looks incredible too. I'm being attacked by crabs. I'm being attacked by crabs. Crabs defeated. Of course, we couldn't test an RTX 3080 gaming PC without testing the latest and greatest Cyberpunk 2077. But this is an absolutely beautiful city, as you can see. This is running at 4K at the Ray Tracing Ultra preset. And you can see we do actually have a very respectable frame rate here of around about 48 frames a second. This does have DLSS on automatic, but you wouldn't really be able to notice, to be honest. But if you are playing on a 1440p display, you can see it is actually possible to get Ray Tracing Ultra presets at over 60 frames a second in the city, where things really do get very difficult. I think that's pretty impressive. Jumping straight into Apex Legends, as we touch the ground, I would expect to see that rise, and indeed it has around about 120 frames a second. And remember that this is at 4K max settings. And I don't know about you, but for someone like myself, Apex is the sort of game I tend to play most of the time. So if you grab yourself a high refresh rate monitor, even at 4K, you're going to be able to get a lot of frame rate out of this machine. Last, but certainly not least, it's Warzone, the game that you guys are probably playing more than anything else. Here we are then, we're on the floor in the Rebirth event, and we're actually getting around about 100 frames a second, which in itself is very impressive. But don't forget, this is 4K max settings once again. And the thing is, 4K is definitely by no means essential. I mean, it's quite the opposite, really, for anything multiplayer. But a game like Warzone, where it is actually quite important to be able to see into the distance, you can make use of that extra resolution. 1440p now, we've reduced it ever so slightly, and we're getting around about 160 frames a second, which is actually fully saturating this monitor that I'm playing on now, so you know you're getting the lowest latency possible. If you were choosing a monitor and you were going to play something like Warzone, then 1440p high refresh rate would be my pick. Maybe ultra wide, but of course I would leave that entirely down to you. I probably should do a little sound test for you though. This is a weird position for me to be in. So there we go then, our RTX 3080 gaming PC that not only performs brilliantly in the latest titles, but has quite a few tricks up its sleeves with things like DLSS and ray tracing. There's definitely a few things that I would change. I mean, to be honest, it's not the most memorable case for me in the world. I think there are definitely cheaper options that are maybe a little bit easier to build in, have a bit more compatibility. I do like what they've done here. It's, it's certainly not bad for a first attempt at a case from Razer. Let me know your thoughts down in that comment section below. Do you like the look of the Razer case? Would you go for an all white build like this? I would absolutely love to hear from you. If you want to check out current pricing on any of the parts featured, then you can of course find them with my Amazon affiliate links listed down below. There are more builds in the end screen if you do want to see maybe something a little bit cheaper or maybe in a different form factor, so go and check those out. Smash that like button if you've enjoyed this video, get subscribed for more, and I'll see you in the next one.